All right, so I am Dr. Mealy with Aspen Integrated Medical Center. Thanks everybody for coming. Just wanted to talk with you all a little bit about fall and winter immune support since we are moving into those seasons right now. Uh, COVID's going around, flu, strep, all sorts of viral bacterial infections. So I just wanted to present some home and lifestyle things that could be helpful. So a little bit about me. So I'm a naturopathic physician at Aspen Integrative. Uh, Dr. Paul is my husband. I mainly do primary care as well as women's health, autoimmune disease. I like to also treat gastrointestinal concerns. I do a lot of manual therapy, which are um, hands-on modalities like craniosacral therapy and visceral manipulation. Um, and as well as practice a lot of botanical medicine. Um, I did a lot of training outside of medical school in botanical medicine, so I love to formulate custom formulations for patients, teas, tinctures, all sorts of things, um, as well as getting to know our local plants and wildcrafting. I really love that. So first thing I wanted to talk about in terms of lifestyle is vitamin D. So vitamin D exposure is huge for immunity. Why is that? It does so many things to the body to support immune function. So whether we have maybe overactive immune function, if we have something like an autoimmune disease, like autoimmune thyroid disease or autoimmune bowel disease, it can help to turn down immune function if things are overactive. It can also help to upregulate immune function if we're trying to fight off a viral or a bacterial infection. It's also really important for hormonal regulation. So, you know, um, hormonal regulation is dependent on a lot of different factors in the body. One of them is getting plenty of fats in the diet because all our hormones are synthesized from fats, cholesterol, and steroid. So getting proper vitamin D balance is really important to make sure that one, our body is producing enough hormones and two, that we have supports online so that things can be regulated. It also plays a huge role in our sleep and wake cycles. That's more tied to direct sunlight and dark exposure. So, you know, making sure that we do get some sunlight exposure each day, whether that be, you know, in the morning or late evening. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Also really important for mineral balance in the body. So our calcium and phosphate, um, phosphorus levels are directly dependent on how much vitamin D is in the system. So the body is kind of constantly playing this titration game and saying, you know, if I have too much calcium or too little calcium, too much phosphorus, too little phosphorus, it needs vitamin D to very tightly regulate that. And a lot of that has to do with bone function. So prevention of things like osteoporosis, fracture risk, something we definitely want to think about as we age. Uh, most people are deficient, even in the state of Arizona, where we get a lot of direct sunlight and we're at a um, lower longitude and latitude. So, you know, we're a little bit closer to the sun. I used to live in the Pacific Northwest where, you know, we're very far from the sun. So that's different. But, you know, most of the lab work that I'm seeing looking at vitamin D levels, people are deficient. Sometimes if you get a vitamin D level checked with another physician, they might say, oh, you're, you know, you're in the normal range. That looks good. Um, that's not necessarily true. We need a different range to support optimum function and all of these things that I described, the immune function, the hormone regulation, the sleep and the wake cycles. So levels that I like to see are at least 40. Um, normal can fall below 40. Um, if you have an autoimmune disease, I definitely like to see patients on the higher end. So around 60 to 80. Um, that's definitely something that you should talk about with your practitioner if you have had your vitamin D tested. If you would like to get it tested, now would be a good time to look at it as we kind of move into cold and flu season to see, should I be supplementing more? So how do you do this? How do you get exposure beyond supplementation? So morning and evening sun exposure is really important. So just going on a 10 minute walk early in the morning when the sun is out or in the evening, this is going to give you access to the infrared spectrum of light. 
So this is the healing spectrum of light that's really only present in morning and evening sunlight. That's really not around in the peak hours of sun exposure that we hear about, which is typically somewhere around 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. You want to make sure that, you know, sun is at least getting on your face, on your hands. Um, you know, if you're walking, jogging, you know, walking briskly and you feel, you know, I can take off my uh, sweater or my jacket and expose the arms, that's really great too. Supplementation can be anywhere from one to 10,000 international units daily. So vitamin D is dosed in international units. Um, we've kind of moved over to micrograms as well. So you might see on a supplement bottle IU, which just means international unit, or you might see microgram. Um, two products that we have available at Aspen, we have a, 10, a 2000 IU daily, which is a good daily amount. Um, we also have a 10,000 IU daily, which is good to have around um, if you have something like the flu, COVID, and acute illness. Um, I just really want to reiterate that vitamin D is so important for so many different bodily functions. It's kind of like the regulator in the body. It's regulating hormones. It's regulating immune function. It's regulating our circadian rhythm. And it's really, really important for all different, um, all system health. So these are just some easy ways that you can get some exposure or supplement. Um, I did want to mention that sometimes higher food sources of vitamin D are things like fresh or wild caught seafood, especially salmon. Cod liver oil is a good source of vitamin D, some dairy products. Um, some people talk about mushrooms as being a vegan source of vitamin D. That's not a source of D3, which is the form that we want to supplement with and is a fully converted form. Um, it is a source of D2, so that is a little bit different, and I hear patients talk about some that sometimes, so I wanted to mention that. The next is exercise. So why is this important for our immune function? When we exercise, it helps to upregulate our metabolic activity. Why is this important? If we're upregulating our metabolism, there's all sorts of biochemical reactions and functions that have to be turned on. So similar to how we were talking about vitamin D being able to either upregulate or downregulate immune activity, exercise really does the same thing. Um, so it can modulate what we call modulate. So that would mean turning on or turning off if there's too much immune function or too little, um, upregulating our metabolism, which has so many other benefits for our health. It also really helps with circulation of lymph. There's not many things that do that. Walking is a really good way to do that. Um, any form of rebounding is a really good way to do that. So, um, you know, if you have a rebounder or a mini trampoline, if your children, your grandchildren have a trampoline, um, that is a really good way to circulate lymph in the body. Our lymphatic system is so closely tied to our immune function, and there's not really a way in conventional medicine to address our lymphatic function. We have herbs that do that as well, but exercise is kind of the easiest way to get everything in the body flowing and circulating so that we make sure our immune function and our cellular function is nice and healthy. So morning and evening walks, we just talked about that. You can get in your exercise, you can get in your vitamin D exposure. 10 minutes of walking after meals is going to be something that not only is a form of exercise, but is also balancing to the blood sugar. So I have lots of patients that either have type 2 diabetes or they have pre-diabetes, meaning they have elevated blood sugar levels, but not at the level that's classified as diabetes. So when we go on a walk directly after eating, we signal to all of that sugar that's in the bloodstream that has been broken down from the meal that we just ate. And we say, don't hang out on the blood, go straight into the muscle. It gives it something to do. Otherwise, if we just go, we sit on the couch, we watch Netflix, whatever we're doing after a meal, that broken down starch, sugar, glucose molecules is just hanging out in the bloodstream. And it's, it's allowing... Um, our receptors to become less sensitive to insulin, which is plays a big role in um, pre-diabetes and diabetes. So if we go on that walk right after eating, um, even if you just do it twice a day, there's really good research backing that that's supportive to lower blood sugar levels and keep a healthy, favorable balance. 
I would also recommend picking something that brings you joy. If you don't like going to the gym, don't go. Do something that you enjoy doing. Dance, being with children or grandchildren. We're getting into the winter sports season. So doing something like snowshoeing, skiing, snowboarding. Um, I know there's lots of dance groups around town. Um, there's so many beautiful hikes, walking. Just pick something that you enjoy. You're more likely to do it. And you're more likely to have fun while you do it, which is also supportive for your immune system to, you know, experience happiness, joy, and get some laughter in as well. So the next lifestyle change that we have is infrared sauna therapy. So that is actually a picture of the inside of the infrared sauna that we have at Aspen. And why is this important and how does this help our immune system? So when we expose the body to extreme heat. This is a stress on the body. So the response that the body has to that is it increases our total white blood cell count. And these are the cells that show up first when we have a viral infection, a bacterial infection. We want that white count to go up so that our body is more able to fight things off. So it's stimulating our immune activity in a favorable way. And this helps to boost clearance of pathogens. So, you know, there are a lot of things um, that we recommend to patients um, when they have an acute fever or they're getting ill. Heating the body is a good thing because this helps to increase the white blood cell count, stimulate the immune activity so the body can go and do what it needs to do with the pathogen. We do have infrared sauna packages available. You can try it for uh, one time. You don't have to buy a package. Um, we're lucky enough to have a sauna at our home. I used it today and felt great. Um, but, you know, don't push yourself if you've never done it before. Just start at 15 or 20 minutes and see how you feel. You don't have to get in there and say, I'm going to be in here for an hour. And that's what I have to do because we can definitely build up tolerance and work our way up to that. Um, there are a lot of different saunas that are on the market available for purchase for home use. Some of them are more just enclose the body and the head is free. Um, so there are a lot of different ways. I believe there is one local gym in town that also has a sauna. I don't believe it's infrared, but that's still beneficial to the body. I also wanted to talk about some hydrotherapy techniques. So these are great to follow infrared sauna. They also work in that same way to increase the white count and stimulate immune activity so we can clear out those pathogens. These are really easy, simple things that you can do at home that don't cost anything. So if you have a sauna or if you've taken a really hot bath, you've stimulated some sweating, it's nice to either do a cold shower or rinse after that. Um, if you have a tub, you can fill it with cold water as well. You can take a hot shower, do a minute or two in the cold tub. Or if you're just taking a hot bath or shower, when you get out, you can just kind of have like a cold towel or a washcloth. You just kind of rinse the body with it, getting the arms, getting the neck, getting some of the chest and legs. This really helps with improving circulation in the same way that exercise does. So you're improving circulation throughout the body, you're improving lymphatic flow, you're doing things that are kind of giving the body a stress to deal with. Um, when we do contrast, so I've written down here, contrast showers daily at home, that means doing a hot shower and then ending with neutral or cold water. So even just doing the neutral or the cold at the end of a shower for 30 seconds is going to be beneficial for the, for the immune system, for circulation. It's also really energizing. If you've never been from a really hot environment and then immersed yourself in cold, especially with water, it has a very unique and stimulating effect on the cells in the body, and it just feels really good. Um, it almost feels kind of like a, a rush of adrenaline and energy. So I definitely recommend trying some of these really at he, uh, easy at home hydrotherapy techniques. The next thing that I've kind of written here is talking about kitchen habits. So garlic, ginger, and onions are super supportive for the immune system. So um, in terms of, I'm a plant person, so I'll break this down a little bit. 
Onions and garlic are in the same genus of plants. They're in the allium genus. So they have very similar actions within the body. So all of these um, food items, garlic, ginger, onions, you can easily get them at the grocery store. Um, farmer's market is over here this season, but if you happen to be on a weekend trip down to the valley or somewhere else, check out their farmer's market and see what they have. Um, all of these items are supportive for viral and bacterial infections. They all have research showing that they're antimicrobial, meaning they'll fight off virus, or they'll fight off bacterial infections. Um, they're also antiviral. They're also really easy to get your hands on and do things at home. So the way that they help the body is that they're warming to the body. These things are what we call aromatic and pungent. So if you, you know, if you taste something that has a lot of ginger in it, a lot of garlic, you kind of feel it in your nose, you feel it warming the body. So this is helpful. Not only does it increase circulation in the body, ginger specifically, but the garlic, ginger, and onions, anything aromatic and pungent will warm the body up. This helps to thin and clear the mucus. So if we think about this from a constitutional perspective, if we have a condition like COVID or the flu or an upper respiratory infection, we have a lot of mucus, usually in the chest, the lower re um, respiratory tract, upper tract, or within the sinuses. Um, that's very a damp condition on the body. Anything that has a lot of phlegm or mucus. We don't wanna put more things in the body that are damp and cold. That can just drive that deeper. So, you know, drinking something like a smoothie or eating ice cream, you're adding more damp to a damp system. What you want to do is you want to warm that system up so that phlegm and that mucus and that stagnation can clear and exit the body. So any aromatic or pungent herb or food is going to do that. Another one that I would include here is horseradish, if you do like that as well. It's very easy to just kind of chop these things up and add them to whatever you're making. So you can make some preparations that you can use all winter and that can be stored. Um, I've included a recipe, you'll get these slides. Um, I've included a recipe for an infused garlic honey. Um, it is tastier than it sounds. You can also do this with onions. Making an infused honey is really easy. It's as easy as chopping up something fresh, letting it sit in honey for a period of time. And then that honey kind of takes on the properties and taste of that herb. And you already have something nice that's antiviral, antibacterial. You can take a teaspoon or a tablespoon of it and there you go. Making a strong ginger tea with fresh peeled root. Very easy to pick up and do at the store. Um, I would recommend simmering that. You don't want to boil. Ginger has what we call in it a lot of volatile oils. Those are the, the nice smell that you get. Those are the things that are antimicrobial. So you want to simmer that for at least 20 minutes. Don't want to boil it. Um, adding garlic, onion, and ginger to soup bases and stir fries as well. So that can just be the base of a dish, whatever way that you can get that in with your cooking. Um, and if you find it difficult to peel ginger root, I kind of have a quick way that I was shown that's really helpful. So you have your root right here. If you really just take the back of a spoon and you just scrape gently, that skin will come right off. So it's super easy. You can do that with uh, ginger and turmeric as well. If you just want to peel the root, if you're going to be chopping it finely for something like a, a curry or a soup. So this is an immune tea. Um, the first time I had this, I was very sick and my husband made it for me. And so we've kind of modified it together. So I would get about a two inch piece of fresh turmeric root chopped. Again, you can use that same peel technique if you want to put the skin off. I would use a large piece of fresh ginger root. So me, I like ginger. I'd feel comfortable using this whole thing, but you know, you could use maybe just this section or half of this three to four cloves of garlic chopped. So if you're gonna be straining this where you can strain it or you can finely chop everything. If you wanna strain it, you just leave the skin on the garlic. You're getting good stuff in there. You just chop it roughly. Um, if you're gonna wanna just ingest all of the roots, which you totally can, you can finely chop everything. I would do the juice of one whole lemon 
And then honey to taste after you're done making this. So honey has a lot of immune stimulating and antimicrobial properties, especially raw local honey. But if you're going to put it in boiling water, you're going to denature it. So I would let the tea cool a little bit and then add your honey. So first you're going to simmer your garlic, ginger, and turmeric in about two quarts of water for at least 20 minutes. So remember we said simmer, not boil. Um, I would recommend putting a lid over that so you can keep those good oils in there. I would turn off the heat and add juice of the lemon and one half to a tablespoon of honey. Just kind of add it to your taste. If it's something that you're making for your children, I would probably do more so a tablespoon. If you're going to try it for yourself, just start with a half and see. Then you can stir, strain, and enjoy. I think it tastes wonderful. Um, the, it doesn't taste garlicky to me. It kind of blends in with the ginger, ginger and turmeric. They are also in the same plant family. They just kind of blend very nicely together. The last thing that I wanted to talk about are adaptogenic herbs. So what are they? Adaptogen has the word adapt in it. So that's what they do. They help the body adapt to stress of any kind. We can have all sorts of types of stress. It can be physical, environmental, mental, a pathogenic stress, such as a virus or a bacteria. And they're really, they can be specific to different body systems, but they really will go in any system of the body and aid things. So I put two of my favorites down here at the bottom. One of them is astragalus, which is in the picture here. Um, astragalus, we have a local species. It is not edible in the same way. So I would go to an herb store like Winter Sun and I would purchase chopped astragalus root. Um, really easy to prepare as a tea. It has a kind of a nutty and sweet flavor. Really easy to prepare when you're making a soup stock. So you just kind of throw it in with all your other ingredients and it's part of the soup and now it's an immune boosting stock. It's not just a stock. At Aspen, we have Astragalus Supreme Capsules, which is a Gaia product. I really like that one for, um, you know, general immune support. Typically, we don't want to use Astragalus when we have an acute infection. It can kind of drive things deeper so that this would kind of be a, a thing that you would take daily during cold and flu season. Um, it has a really uh, strong history of use in Chinese medicine. Um, it is a root, so it's building and nourishing. It has some affinity for the kidneys and the respiratory tract. So I really like to use it post-COVID or as a daily immune support, especially if someone has something like a history of asthma or COPD. Uh, the other herb that I wanted to talk about is Eleutherococcus. That's its Latin name. It's Siberian ginseng. So it's a different form of ginseng than Korean or American ginseng. It's really good as a daily tonic for longevity, for increasing um, exercise function and ability, um, for oxygenating the body, as well as just being a really good adaptogen for environmental and support against colds, flus, any type of viral or bacterial illness. Um, we have both of these herbs in tincture form at the clinic, so we would be happy to formulate an immune tincture for you if you want to do that. Um, there are lots of products on the market that have Siberian ginseng in them already. Um, it just kind of depends on how you like to get things in the body. Um, this is also something that you can buy as what we call a bulk herb. So you go into an herb store or you order online. Um, the places that I like to order from online are either Mountain Rose Herbs or Star West Botanicals. Those are great places to order herbs from. And again, just like we said with the astragalus, you can just make your soup stock with your garlic, ginger, onions, put some astragalus in there, put some Siberian ginseng in there, and you have an immune boosting soup. So that is all I have for you. I would love to take questions if there are any. Uh, we will have another webinar on the 27th at 6 p.m. with my colleague, Dr. Flannery. She is doing Happy Gut, Happy Holidays. Are there any questions that I can answer? Feel free to put them in the chat.
Someone said, what about wet socks? How does that help the immune system? Great question. Um, so wet socks is another hydrotherapy technique that works very similarly to infrared sauna and other general hydrotherapy techniques. It helps to stimulate the white blood cell count as well as to increase circulation um, and lymphatic function in the body. So it's really, really stimulating to immune function. So if you've never done that before, um, you can get in a hot bath or a hot shower, something that's going to heat the body up, a sauna if you have it. And after you get out, you're going to have two pairs of socks. One should be a thin cotton pair. The other should be a wool pair. You'll wet the thin cotton socks in cold water and wring them out. We don't want them to be super wet. We just want them to hold the cold. You'll put on the cold socks. I know it sounds terrible, but it really feels invigorating once you do it. And then you put the dry wool socks over and then you need to get in bed and bundle up and go to sleep. So that's helping to draw blood down from the top of the body to the bottom of the body. It's helping to stimulate immune function by increasing white blood cell count. And it's really, really good if you have a lot of congestion and irritation in the sinuses and in the head. So if you have sinus pressure, pain here, pain here, those are where our sinuses are in our head. Um, it's really good to just kind of help clear, thin that mucus and helpful for congestion. Any other questions? So there is a question about what IVs do we offer that would be great for the immune system. So we have a lot of different IV therapy that we offer. Um, we have general immune boosting IVs. We have vitamin C IVs. We have things like EGCG, which is an extract from green tea. Um, so it would really be, um, you know, if you're acutely ill and you want to come in for an IV, we can kind of design something generally for you that would boost immune function and help with clearance of bacteria and pathogens. Um, if you are kind of in the throes of an illness, something like COVID, and you feel like your normal things aren't uh, budging, I would definitely recommend doing an IV ozone treatment. So either doing... Um, that with Dr. Paul or Dr. Flannery, and they'll help get you situated with that. But if you have general questions about you just kind of want something to boost immune support, you know, you can speak with one of us and we can formulate something custom for you or just kind of suggest what would be appropriate based on what we already offer. Um, Sharon asked, how often to sauna and how long each time? Great question, Sharon. So I would definitely recommend try first trying with sauna just once a week, and then you can increase from there to see how much you tolerate. I would first start at about 15 to 20 minutes and see how you tolerate that. So what does that mean? That means when you get in the sauna, just kind of, just kind of gauge your body and say, you know, how long does it take me to start up a sweat? When you first start opening up the detox pathways, it might take you that whole 20 minutes to break a sweat. So that lets us know that the body needs a little bit of help and aid in opening the detoxification pathways. So I would start at once a week and do about a 15 to 20 minute session. If you feel like you tolerate that well, you can definitely increase to twice a week, 20 minutes. I would say maximum amount of time, probably 45 minutes. Um, and that way, you know, the entire time that you're in the sauna, kind of just gauging your body, making sure that you're drinking plenty of water. Um, if you do have conditions that cause dizziness or lightheadedness, um, letting us know that so that we can monitor you. Um, some conditions, things like POTS or dysautonomia um, or orthostatic hypotension can make it difficult to withstand the heat. So letting us know if things like that are going on as well is helpful too. And it looks like there's one more. Of course, you are so welcome. Glad to be here. Kim asks, how many I use uh, of vitamin D do I recommend? Um, so that really depends. If you are somebody that has an autoimmune disease, that is going to look very different than somebody who does not have autoimmunity. 
Um, generally for patients that have autoimmune disease, I like to check their levels first and then either do five to 10,000 IU daily, depending on where they're at. But just for, you know, your normal everyday person, totally fine to do 5,000 IU daily. Um, the only situation I would not recommend that in is if somebody has a condition with their kidneys. So if they have something like chronic kidney disease or if they have issues with their parathyroid glands. Typically, patients would know this. These are already diagnosed conditions. So if you do have kidney disease or issues with parathyroid, or if you've had thyroid removal, then we definitely want to talk about that more in depth. Um, but typically, 5,000 is fine for most people. Any other questions? So I don't see any other questions coming in, but thank you all so much for coming and I would love to do more webinars for you. And I hope you have a nice holiday next week. Thank you so much.